itching, burning, white, thick discharge from your vagina, none of that is normal. In fact, that might be a sign that you have a yeast infection. I'm Dr. Jolene Brayton, and we're going to take a minute here to talk through yeast infections, the signs, the symptoms, what causes it, what to do about it, and then I'm going to take some questions. So first things first, it is never normal to have thick white discharge coming from the vagina, nor is it normal to have a bright red vagina or vulva. So yeast infection, it can, so we've got the vagina that's inside, but it can also inflame the tissues that are on the outside. So with that, you may see red tissue, it may be swollen, you may have pain with urination, you may have pain with intercourse, and itching and burning tends to be the very, very common symptom that women really are tipped off to that, yes, in fact, I have a yeast infection. So what do we do? Do we go and do we test first thing? Do we need to make a doctor's visit? Well, in general, we don't need to make a doctor's visit right away if we suspect that we have a yeast infection. In fact, we can use over-the-counter medications or we can get a prescription from our doctor. We can also use natural remedies. I'm going to speak to some of those. Um, and when we do want to see a doctor is when we can't clear that yeast infection or it's coming every single month at the same time, or maybe despite all the treatments, things are just getting worse. If you're ever concerned, that's another good reason to go see your doctor and then figure out what is going on. Now, typically, a culture is not going to be done right away. Now, if you happen to be at the gynecologist and you are getting a pap smear, they may actually take a swab, put it underneath the microscope and visualize that there's yeast there and then recommend that you treat it. It is very rare that the first thing that we do is a culture. Now, this will differ, though, if you are going to a functional medicine or naturopathic physician and you find that you have recurring yeast infections, then we will do a culture to not only figure out what is growing there, but also what is it susceptible to and how can we treat that? Because sometimes things like oregano and tea tree oil and boric acid is helpful, and other times we do need to use a pharmaceutical. We'll talk about a couple of those and what we should consider with that. But of course, if you're ever concerned, go to your doctor, and if you can't clear the infection, know that just because it looks like yeast and it feels like yeast and, and you believe that you have a yeast infection doesn't mean you can't have other infections that are going on at the same time. Now, we need to talk about how to prevent yeast infections. And to do that, we need to talk about what causes yeast infections. So we have a delicate balance of flora in our body. So not only good gut bugs, we think a lot about those in the microbiome, but also in your vagina. It has its own ecosystem. And with that, Anything that disrupts the ecosystem can cause changes in your pH and the organisms that grow there. So what causes a yeast infection? It's specifically an organism known as candida. And what we typically see is candida albicans is the most common. But there's other species that can also cause yeast. So that's just the most common. And with that, you need to understand that yeast is always present. It's always there. It's in your mouth, it's in your gut, it's on your skin, it's in the air, it's in your vagina, it is everywhere. But it's opportunistic. And so what that means is, is that given the opportunity, it will overgrow. So what gives it the opportunity to overgrow? Well, anything that disrupts the pH of your vagina. So your period can do that. Period blood changes the pH. And when we're talking about pH, yeah, flashback to chemistry. We're talking base, acid, and neutral. And with that, your period, the blood itself can change the pH of your vagina. Things for like tampons for some women can change the pH. It's not true for all women. And we don't have research on like, is it an organic tampon? Is it like, like what kind of tampon is it? But it tends to be that things that we put in our vagina can shift the pH and mess with the ecology. So things like tampons, douches, even semen. So semen can actually alter the ecology and the pH of your vagina. Um, being pregnant, estrogen therapy, hormonal birth control. Hormonal birth control is a big reason why women get yeast infections. So if you're on the pill or you have a Nuva ring or any kind of contraceptive that's in the vagina, it's uh, well in the uterus is so 
Well, it depends on the contraceptive. So if it's an IUD, it's in the uterus. If it's that Nuva ring, that's going to be in the vagina. Um, and with that, if you're taking like oral contraceptives or really using any kind of hormones, that can disrupt what's growing in your vagina and leave you susceptible to yeast infections. Now, have you ever heard that like... Um, if you go swimming and you wear your swimsuit too long, you could get a yeast infection. Or like if you're in sweaty gym clothes, you could get a yeast infection. It's true. What your mom told you was true. And the reason for that is because that's a very warm and moist place, your vagina. I know some people don't like it when we use the word moist. Sorry. Um, if you're one of those people, let me just like apologize there. Sorry about that. But it is a perfect place for yeast to overgrow. And so certainly if you are someone who's susceptible, that's a practice that could push you over the edge and make you more susceptible to recurrent or a first time yeast infection. Now, the other thing that we need to consider is your blood sugar. So you may have heard about these anti-candida diets and you eat no sugar of any kind, and you may be wondering if there's truth to that. Well, the reality is, is that sugars of any kind, whether it be sugar, sugar, so sugar itself or refined carbohydrates or alcohol can contribute to yeast infections. And if you are having recurrent yeast infections, this is why I say go to your doctor it may very well be the first sign of diabetes or the first sign of polycystic ovarian syndrome why you're getting uh, yeast infections and you can understand what to do about it. But one big why we haven't discussed yet is the use of antibiotics and really anything that alters your gut ecology. So what grows in your gut gets shared with your vagina and you may think that's gross, but sorry, that's real talks human. Um, so with that, if you take an antibiotic, if you are, you know, using any kind of medication like hormonal birth control, which also lowers microbial diversity, we know that antidepressants can do this as well. And we're understanding more and more every day about things that alter our gut flora. Anything that messes with your gut can mess with your vagina as well. And it's really those lactobacillus species and those good good bacteria. Um, I do those little quotes because it's not like a whole lot of bad stuff grows in our gut and there can be imbalance of things. And that's what's happening with yeast infections is that there can be an imbalance. Now, I want to cut to the chase of like, what do we do about all of this? So we've talked about the symptoms, what it looks like to have a yeast infection, when's a good time to go to your doctor, and what are some of the reasons that make us susceptible to a yeast infection? And I, I would be remiss if I didn't say, yeah, if you're immunocompromised, that could also be an issue with yeast infection. So that's a consideration. But I want to talk about like, what, what do we do about these? Okay, so first things first, do yeast infections just go away on their own? Sorry, they don't typically. It is possible that they self-resolve, but usually we need some kind of intervention. And having a yeast infection can actually keep you from sleeping at night because that itching, burning pain can be so uncomfortable that maybe you're not getting sleep. And so that's how much a yeast infection can really disrupt your life. And so getting symptom relief is, is a must with yeast infections. Now, the typical yeast infection treatment, uh, when we talk conventionally, is usually something internal like monostat. That definitely works a lot quicker. Or something oral like fluconazole, more commonly known as diflucan. Now, with that, diflucan can be really effective taken orally, but it can take a few days to kick in. And with that, you know, if you need to use monostat over the counter to get symptom relief, no judgment here, but you should know that it does contain ingredients that are known endocrine disruptors. And that while both of those medications, the diflucan and the monostat, can resolve the yeast infection, it doesn't address the root cause. So you need both in, in this situation. When you have a yeast infection, we need to treat the symptoms and we need to treat the root cause. And that's something that naturopathic physicians and functional medicine doctors are super, super good at. Okay, so. So with that, you need relief fast. You can consider calling your doctor, getting a Diflucan prescription. You can consider going to the grocery store or, you know, to the pharmacy and getting over-the-counter monostat or something similar to that to treat it. Or you can consider using natural treatment, something like boric acid. So let me say this. Boric acid is toxic if you take it internally. 
don't do that. That's bad. Okay. Um, and if you go to the environmentalworkinggroup.org, you'll see that they talk about boric acid being a potential endocrine disruptor. And so that's something we need to consider. Now, is that a problem when we use it for yeast infections? Not usually for the short term and the amount that we would use, but if you're using these things over and over and over, we have to keep in mind if it's messing with your hormones, it can leave you more susceptible to yeast infections. So with that, boric acid is something you typically have to get compounded. So you would need to have your doctor call it into a compounded pharmacy. It used to be, and in some states, you can still get it over the counter from a pharmacist and actually put it in capsules and insert it vaginally. This has been shown to be very effective in treating yeast infections. So that is a more natural therapy to go with if you don't want to go the monostat or the um, diflucan route. And in some places, it's actually cheaper to use boric acid. Now, of course, this is the moment where I have to remind you that, well, I am a doctor, I'm not your doctor, and that if you do have something going on, you need to see your doctor and have a conversation. This is education. This is not medical advice, and it shouldn't be constituted as anything that would replace your medical provider. But let's keep going here. So we talked a little bit about the pharmaceutical option. I want to talk a little bit more about what you can do naturally. So we talked about the boric acid. Um, the other piece I want to talk about is your diet. So the common question is, is there a best diet for yeast infections? If you have a one-off yeast infection, it's one, it's done, it never comes back. Your diet may not be a large issue in all of this. But if you're having recurrent yeast infections or you're someone who's like, I get a vaginal yeast infection, I have a white coat on my tongue, it seems like yeast is my issue, it's a good idea to avoid sugar, refined carbohydrates, and while you have an active yeast infection, avoiding those plus alcohol. And alcohol is something that, uh, you know, we don't commonly think about as a sugar, but in fact, it really can fuel that yeast infection and, and really fuel the fire that is going on in your groin. And that's not fun. So you want to avoid those foods while you're actively treating a yeast infection. And if your yeast persists, it's a good consideration to remove the sugar, the refined carbohydrates and alcohol from your diet until you can really get a handle on all of that. Your diet influences the microbial growth in your entire digestive tract, which in turn influences what's growing in your vagina. And so I know that while well, sugar, carbohydrates, and uh, like refined carbohydrates and alcohol can be delicious and fun and are great in moderation, if you feel you can never eat these foods, or if you're in a situation where you're like, I can never eat those foods or I get a yeast infection, you need further investigation. Something's not right there. And that's typically the time where I will do gut testing. So doing something like perhaps a stool culture and then following up with treatment using high quality probiotics, antimicrobials, um, and doing some work to really rebuild the gut. One probiotic that I really love using um, in, in women's health altogether is the Megaspore probiotic. You can find that at drbrighton.com. It's because it's a spore-based probiotic and it actually influences your terrain to want to have more of these good guys around. And uh, when it comes to vaginal in, uh, yeast infections, it can be beneficial. And I've done this with patients where I compound a lactobacillus um, and, and sometimes bifido, but it's primarily lactobacillus suppository to insert in the vagina. Those good gut bugs, they will throw down in your gut. And if they're in your vagina, so like lactobacillus rhamnosus is really prevalent in the vagina, it also will throw down against that yeast and not let them overgrow. So sometimes Times, yeah. So if you ever heard, um, you know, old wives tales, what they call it, where women would say, if you're on antibiotics, eat probiotic rich yogurt or use plain yogurt in your vagina. That's because yogurt tends to be fermented with lactobacillus. And so um, that is something that can be really beneficial for when you're on antibiotics, but also if you have a yeast infection, because those lactobacillus species set up a terrain that inhibits the growth of yeast overall. So that's another natural treatment. So we've talked about boric acid, we've talked about some dietary shifts that you can make, and we've talked about using lactobacillus species in probiotics. Now, I often get women who ask about, well, what about using oregano oil or tea tree oil? Okay, 
While that is antimicrobial and it can help with yeast, it also can be really, really painful if you put that in your vagina or on the labia or the vulva itself, especially if, so yeast tends to inflame the tissue. And in some of us, we can even get fissures. So splintering of like the tissue. So it starts to get cracks in it basically. And so the essential oils can actually really, really hurt and it can damage these really, really tender tissues. And so I have used these before and what I typically do is I compound them. So we work with a compounding pharmacy and we put it in a carrier, usually like a cocoa butter or something along those lines, really, really clean, no endocrine disruptors, so that we can deliver that without hurting the tissue or burning it further. So I've got YouTube in front of me. I've got Instagram over here. I've talked quite a bit and I see all these questions coming through. So I want to answer some of those because they actually dovetail very nicely into talking more about natural therapies. So yeah, the holistic element asks, I had a midwife tell me to insert a garlic clove to help with vaginal infections. What are your thoughts on that? It absolutely can help. So garlic is another natural treatment. It's been used by women like since for Evs. And um, inserting a garlic clove can help. It's very um, antimicrobial and it can work against yeast. So there's women who get great symptom relief. Anytime you put something in the vagina, be sure you're keeping track of it. I know that might sound silly, but women, um, you can Google this. The things that have been lost in vaginas, garlic cloves, definitely. Tampons, definitely. Um, and so anytime you insert something in the vagina, you just want to make sure you keep tabs on it. If you insert garlic in there, make sure you retrieve that garlic later. Um, and that is something that can be effective against uh, yeast infections overall. You know, whenever I'm talking about natural therapies, I want to talk, we want to talk about symptom management because yeast infections are the worst. And like, if you have a good guys in there, keeping that yeast in check and making sure that you don't get recurrent yeast infections. And a big part of that is tending to your gut health. And that's why I talked about doing gut testing, making sure that you've got good pro probiotics coming in, making sure that you're eating uh, fiber rich foods because that feeds those good gut bugs. And another thing you can think about if you have an acute uh, situation, so you have a yeast infection, is perhaps doing a vinegar bath. And so actually sitting in vinegar can help shift the pH and inhibit yeast growth. I would not recommend douching. In fact, um, oh, you're awesome. Your Beyond the Pill book just arrived and you're letting me know that. That's awesome. I do talk about chronic yeast infections in Beyond the Pill as well because it's very, very common for women to experience this and very common with hormonal birth control. Um, thank you for letting me know that. I really appreciate that. That was like a little, that was a little awesome moment for me. So um, when we were when we're talking about uh, vinegar, this is usually a vinegar sits bath. So you actually put some vinegar in a small amount of water. You can do this in your bathtub and sit in that. That will inhibit yeast overgrowth. We don't want to douche. So you're very like. I don't know who you're going to find that recommends douching, but you don't like, we think you have a yeast infection, but you don't actually know. And so what if it's something else that's also going on? You don't want to flood the canal and push things up and end up with an ascending infection. Also, douching is really harsh. I mean, it's almost like antibiotics for your vagina in terms of it, like just messing with the ecology. And so Yes, white vinegar can work really well. Some women use apple cider vinegar. The idea is we're dropping the pH. So a lower pH is more acidic. So thanks for that clarification there. Um, but we don't want to be douching. So douching, that's some, That's like, that's old school. We don't do that anymore because we've come to understand that can be more problematic for women's health. So um, if you missed the beginning of this, we were talking about yeast infections, what causes them, ways to prevent them, ways to manage symptoms naturally, and ways to really prevent chronic yeast infections for, from coming back. So I want to thank you all uh, for being here with me. If you have questions, comments, anything you'd like to hear more about, go ahead and drop them below so that I can see those. This is how I know what you want to hear from me and what kind of content to put out for you to really support you on your journey of women's health. And if you haven't subscribed to my YouTube, that is where these videos live forever. So you definitely want to do that. Hit the subscribe button and that way, anytime I go live or I reduce or I reduce, I produce and new video, you can be in the know about your lady parts, how to care for them best, and how to optimize and balance your hormones naturally.